Give us one hour and we'll help you change the way you think about happiness. Harvesting happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven talk radio that promotes happiness from the inside out. Each week, Lisa spotlights trendsetters and change agents who offer sound emotional fitness tips for improving mental muscle tone and greater well-being. Guest experts include a diverse and proactive collection of the greatest thinkers and doers who are devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. Your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen, is a widely recognized applied positive psychology coach, author, documentary filmmaker, and lecturer specializing in the fields of sustainable happiness, mindfulness, and positive lifestyle management. Let's get to it. Here's Lisa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio, broadcasting consciously prepared brain food from the beaches of Malibu, California. Each week, we explore the very serious business of happiness, sustainable well-being, and human flourishing. We are not talking about that annoying yellow smiley face. No, no, no. We are talking about something much deeper and critical to the success of humanity. Authentic happiness is not selfish, egotistical, or narcissistic. In fact, it is essential in order for humankind to thrive. Sustainable happiness is important because it not only elevates our own well-being locally, but also contributes to collective global flourishing. The achievement of a happy life is not only positively good for us, it is constructively good for those around us. In short, happiness matters. Happiness comes from the heart, and this show is most definitely all about the heart. All righty then, let's get to it. Today we're talking about rest, sleep, and restoring ourselves to better health. My first guest is Dr. Elliot Alfer, who is a dental surgery graduate of Georgetown University Dental School with postgraduate work in oral pathology and periodontics at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. He is an associate clinical professor of oral surgery at George Washington University Medical Center and is on staff at the National Rehabilitation Hospital Prince George's Medical Center and Providence Hospital. He is the founder of the Alpha Center in Washington, D.C., where he helps patients recover from sleep disorders, jaw pain, and helps them to thrive. Dr. Alpha and his wife, Lee, live in Maryland with their standard poodle, Max, who is really in charge. Welcome back, Dr. Alpha. It's a pleasure to have you back on the show. It's been a long time. It has indeed. Let's I'm talk about I'm very about happy the... to be here. Oh, well, I'm, I'm thrilled that, 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 that you're back because sleep and rest is something that most of us are running around the planet deprived of. And I'd love to um, educate our listeners a little bit further or more deeply on the science of good sleep. Fine. What would you like to know? Well, I'd like to know how, how to sleep well. Most of us have this routine in our mind. We come home from the office. We cook our dinner. Uh, sometimes it's probably a large meal. We plop ourselves down in front of the TV simultaneously with our handheld devices. And then we decide it's bedtime and we, and we go to bed. And we may or may not be ready for bed or prepared properly to sleep. Um, <clears throat> that's an art and a science. Uh, first of all, uh, a very heavy meal before you go to bed is contraindicated. The body's working hard at digesting, and it's very difficult to get the hormone levels and, and the other uh, uh, necessary uh, physiology in shape for um, your being able to sleep properly. Uh, we don't want anybody to have anything to eat um, I, usually usually about four hours before you go to sleep. Uh, we don't want technology in the bedroom. Uh, you should do something sort of non-stimulating before you go to sleep. And one of the things you can do to give yourself a better night's rest is to make sure the room is cool and dark. Uh, there, are no, uh, there are no technologic gadgets around. Uh, you have comfortable pajamas. You have a comfortable pillow and mattress. And before you go, you go in to go to sleep, you sit down with a pad and a pen and do what we call a brain dump. And that's uh, where we ask you to uh, write down everything you're thinking about, you're worried about, you have to do tomorrow. So when you lie down to go to sleep, you, you know you're not going to forget anything and your mind is clear. 
One of the things that I have learned over the years from my own research is this powering down process, you know, easing into sleep. In other words, that there's a, a bridge that moves us from the, um, the recreation part of the evening or the or the uh, settling in with the family part of the evening to transitioning into the bedroom. You know, things like, you know, taking a hot bath or a hot shower, chamomile tea, you know, very simple kinds of interventions that send the body and the brain a signal that it's time to transition to rest. Can you talk a little bit about that? I think it's an excellent idea. Anything we can do to sort of power down is fine. Um, but some people have misconceptions as to what powering down is. Yes. And um, so um, what you suggest is very, very good. A nice hot shower, nice hot bath, uh, again, into very comfortable clothes. Uh, into a comfortable bed, a pillow that you're used to, dark room, nice and cool. Make sure there's nothing on your mind. Just lay down and go to sleep. And there really are two things that should be going on in the bedroom, right? One is sleep and the other is sex. And if you're only just doing those things, you're probably going to be better off. Correct. Let's talk a little bit about um, the myth myths around the quantity of sleep that we need. Because um, it used to be uh, told to us that we all need eight hours of sleep. Fact or fiction? Um, that's uh, sort of fiction. We need uh, the adult, average adult needs seven hours of uninterrupted uh, sleep. And what about stories of, like, the watchmen? You know, the, that they say that there's some people who are just hardwired to be up at night and their rhythms are off and they sleep during the day or they sleep in bursts of, you know, three to four hours. They get up, they do something, and they can go down for another three to four hours. Uninterrupted sleep is, is the best. Um, if, if one has to make an interruption in sleep, uh, a 90-minute cycle is the best because that allows you to get from the very first uh, light levels of sleep through an entire sleep cycle and you'll feel much more rested, even though you haven't had much sleep. Um, the uh, the uh, night worker or the shift worker has a real sleep problem. It's, it's difficult to do. Yeah, but it can be done. One can uh, successfully switch their, their circadian rhythms um, through practice, I would think, just like anything else. It's training. Correct, and it's training the body. Um, yes, training the body. Um, talk a little bit about the implications of poor sleep and poor rest on our overall health. Because well, it's I've been told that um, the lack of sleep can make us operate in the same fashion as if we were intoxicated on substances. That's correct. Um, we need um, a certain amount of sleep to basically cleanse the body, renew the chemistry, um, dump extraneous things from the brain, renew the nervous system. And um, if, if you're not doing this, it's like withdrawing from the bank without putting anything back. And yeah. you can't store it up. There's no catching up on sleep. Uh, every Wait. night is important. Hang on, because you said something super important. There is no catching up on sleep. Contrary to popular belief, when we have that weekend sleeping binge, um, we're not really catching up on sleep, right? We're, in fact, disrupting the rhythms even further. That's disrupting the rhythms, that's true, but you're also not, not replacing the biochemistry that should have taken place um, on a routine basis. Hmm. So we're not actually um, filling up the bank again. We're not, not replenishing the deficit. Not at all. Talk a little bit about the relationship of snoring to disrupted sleep, because most of us are, are bedded down with a snore, right? <laughs> at, at least I can speak from my own experience. Um, why is snoring <clears throat> such a detriment to our health and our partner's health? Well, snoring, um, first of all, uh, the vibration of the tissues in that area of the throat is very close to the internal carotid arteries. And in defense of the vibration, they build up uh, calcium deposits on the, in the area that, that is vibrating. 
and then one day a piece breaks off and you have a stroke. So snoring, people that snore have three times more chance uh, of having a stroke than someone who doesn't snore. But unfortunately, uh, the person who lives with a snoring individual and sleeps with that individual, it's like secondhand smoke. Yeah. Um, they may as well snore themselves or have sleep disorders themselves because they're not getting the proper night's sleep. They're tired. They're, they're, their sleep is interrupted. They're constantly giving a sharp elbow in the ribs to somebody, and it's, uh, it's no way to sleep. <laughs> I'm thinking of calling it sleep trauma syndrome. You know, when you're yeah. sleeping next to somebody who is uh, keeping you awake, and, and there's no amount of rolling, nudging, or cajoling to make it stop. That's correct. They're not even most most of the time they're not even aware of what they're doing. Wow. Talk about um, ways in which um, snoring can be treated because. Most people believe that it is um, a CPAP or one of these little masks or oxygen forcing devices that you wear on your nose or on your face that um, can solve the problem. And there are a lot of other innovative ways um, of which you have really been at the forefront in treating patients. Talk a little bit about the oral appliance. Well, if people, uh, patients tell me that have the um, CPAP machine uh, that uh, the uh, they, they may sleep a little better, but they still snore even with a mask on. So uh, huh. it, it's a it's a question of the proximity of tissues in the back of the throat uh, and the volume of air going through, which causes these tissues to vibrate. And also, the uh, if a patient has apnea, the, the sound that they make in exhaling a, a bolus of air or a quantity of air and then uh, quickly waking up slowly and coughing and quickly grabbing another chunk of air and they fall asleep again. So they wake up basically subclinically. They're not really aware of it, but this is what goes on hour after hour and many, many times an hour. <clears throat> and it's a noisy procedure. Um, the oral appliances... Uh, tend to uh, tighten the muscles in the back of the throat and move the tongue out of the airway and stiffen the soft palate so that uh, in many cases we can either reduce or eliminate uh, the snoring sound. Um, sometimes we need uh, auxiliary help, uh, minor surgery such as removing uh, the uvula or part of the soft palate or um, if, if nasal obstruction is the problem, um, doing a septoplasty or uh, a turbinate reduction uh, or removing very large tonsils and adenoids. Uh, sometimes they remove a little small section of the tongue if the tongue, tongue is uh, in the back of the throat and, and considered extremely large. But most of the time, uh, moving the jaw forward and getting the tongue out of the airway will eliminate uh, the snoring. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll carry on the conversation with Dr. Elliot Alfer. To learn more, please visit thealfercenter.com. On Twitter and Facebook, the handle is the same, the Alfer Center. Once again, that's the Alfer Center on Facebook and Twitter. Here comes the break. We'll be right back, and that is a promise. Wait, wait, wait. Before we take that break, I want to talk about creativity and how making things can make you a happier and healthier person. Today's sponsor, Craftsy, is the digital destination devoted entirely to makers. More than 13 million enthusiasts from artists to quilters and beyond make Craftsy their home for binge-worthy on-demand content and access to the world's top experts and curated supplies – all served up in a fun-loving, creative community. This year, resolve to live a more creative life. Sign up for your seven-day free trial at Craftsy.com slash happiness. Once again, it's seven days of free Craftsy at Craftsy.com slash happiness. Here come the tunes. We'll be right back, and that's a promise. We know that life can be tough and that happiness can and does live alongside adversity. 
Connect with us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and follow Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for a daily dose of inspiration. We'll be right back after this quick break. Do you find yourself saying things like, I'll be happy when, or I'll be happy if? Does the finish line for happiness keep moving? Does the bar keep getting higher? What's getting in the way of your happiness right now? Too much going on? Working too much? Not working enough? Having too many responsibilities? Not having enough money, enough time, enough space? The list goes on and on. It becomes difficult to see all that we have if we focus on scarcity. One thing I know for certain, happiness waits for no one. And sometimes we all need support. Are we happy yet? is not another self-help book. It's a guidebook for learning how to harvest happiness through self-mastery, which is the key ingredient into building resilience, hardiness, grit, and emotional stability. Are We Happy Yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. Each day we get to choose how we are going to show up for life. And at times we need tips for strengthening our well-being. Learn training strategies for greater emotional fitness and improved mental muscle tone at HarvestingHappiness.com. Welcome back to Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. If you're just joining us now, we're talking about rest, sleep, and restoring ourselves to better health with Dr. Elliot Alfer. Dr. Alfer, prior to the break, we were talking about um, using uh, an oral appliance to help with snoring and, and, and also um, sleep apnea. Talk a little bit about the growing list of serious illnesses that are attributed to lack of sleep and breathing problems such as snoring and sleep apnea. In addition to the stroke risk, which you mentioned in the first part part of the show, um, lack of oxygen, lack of the proper levels of oxygen, uh, lead all the organs in the body to uh, work harder to sustain their metabolism, and we have metabolic breakdown, uh, which leads to uh, type two diabetes, uh, heart disease. Um, coronary artery disease, we mentioned strokes, um, irritable bowel syndrome, perhaps Parkinson's and um, Alzheimer's disease, and behavioral problems in children. Mm. And one of the things that I've learned also is the, the contribution or attribution of poor sleep to overall mental health, contributing to anxiety and depression. No question about that. It's interesting. In my own practice, I see a lot of clients, um, this is an addiction and trauma recovery, who, of course, are there for substance abuse, but they complain about, um, you know, traveling down the rabbit hole into their substance abuse because they were pursuing a peaceful night's sleep. Um, That's the, the, the chronic pain and trauma, uh, which is is in many cases very difficult difficult to control, and um, they have to use medications, and uh, the patient doesn't get a good night's sleep, and the next thing you know that uh, they are uh, in a chronic pain syndrome, which uh, leads them uh, to depression. Yeah, it's, it's very, very serious. Very depressing and- to wake up. Uh, in the morning with pain and go to sleep in the morning with pain and walk around uh, drugged all day. I mean, you you just feel like you're not awake. Yeah. Not able Um, to function. Well, and it leads to the brain sending the signal to give it more of that drug also. I mean, that's what leads one to the addiction cycle. Correct. You know, the, the euphoria that exists um, for decreased periods of time, unfortunately, uh, is something they seek. It's sort of respite from from pain and aggravation. Yeah. 
Well, uh, with the relief of suffering, right? We're, we're all uh, hardwired for pleasure and uh, really disdain any kind of discomfort or suffering. So one understands how it can happen. Talk a little bit about some of the natural sleep aids available. We mentioned chamomile tea in, in the first segment, but, but there are others. There are um, melatonin. Um, there are a good number of uh, over-the-counter drugs such as uh, uh, Unisom, and a lot of them are based on on uh, Benadryl, um, and uh, they're not not really uh, they're masking a problem. Uh, is what it boils down to. Some uh, are melatonin based, and uh, they tend to adjust circadian rhythms. I'm a big fan of melatonin myself. I use it occasionally. What about valerian root? That's another I one. I was that... just going to say valerian root yeah. is another one. Uh, there's a there's a substance uh, on the market. There's a product on the market that has uh, St. John's wort, valerian root, and several other uh, botanicals in it that uh, patients tell me work very well. And the, probably the best reset is, of all time is getting time outside in nature, you know, n- nature bathing. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, there was a, a Japanese study that talked about stress management, re- reduction of physical signs of stress, and inducing um, good rest and sleep as spending, I think it was eight minutes a day at a minimum, outside next to a tree and if you could not get outside next to a tree that even having the image of nature on your laptop would have some benefit although it's less than actually being outside and getting the benefit of the sun and the fresh air but some some benefit was seen from that as well and we we oftentimes in our busy lives don't don't get outside enough our busy lives are the biggest problem um we have um if you stop to think of the average person, uh, mostly, mainly women in many cases, who have to get the family up and going in the morning, then they have to get themselves going, and they have an hour commute to the office, they work all day at quite a pace, uh, come home, uh, that's another hour commute, and uh, make dinner, uh, clean up the kitchen, and then sit down and help the children with their homework and perhaps put them to bed. Uh, it's hard to work in eight hours or seven hours of sleep with a schedule like that. Oh, indeed. Um, talk a little bit about some other ways that we can help induce uh, a, a restful night. Uh, you know, is going to bed early the answer? Going to bed at a, a earlier would be a good idea if you're a night owl. Um, but going to bed at the same time every night is uh, the body sort of adjusts its circadian rhythm to that sort of um, standardization. Um, Another good release of tension is to take your dog for a walk. Before bed. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. And the air is usually fresh. There's nobody around. You, 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 You commiserate with your pet. You pet them. Your blood pressure goes way down. They're wonderful things. And what about the old-fashioned warm glass of milk? Fact or fiction? Uh, fiction. Really? So, yeah, there isn't much in milk that's going to put you to sleep. So the tryptophan, which that that's another uh, uh, natural supplement, right, is tryptophan. Mm-hmm. And there was a scare many years ago, and it was removed from the market, but I think it has made its way back. It probably has, but you can ha- get more pleasure out of it if you take a six ounce block of fat free turkey and uh, yeah. have, have that before you go to sleep a little glass of warm water and you're off and running speaking of a glass of something what about a glass of wine before bed helpful uh, unhelpful not help not healthy because wine you know it will give you a little bit of buzz but as it metabolizes it becomes a stimulant Cause, because it's sugar turns to sugar yeah correct so if you're going to have you know the red wine for all of its antioxidant properties best to be done with the with the dinner meal and with, the dinner it, with, meal, with space before dinner before sleep sure. rather sure way before uh, sleep way before sleep 
Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned earlier a new pillow makes a world of difference. Talk a little bit about the actual bedding itself, like the proper kind of bed and pillows, because everybody's got a preference and every body is is slightly different. But is Correct. it the mushy bed, you know, the mushy, soft, co- cozy, comfy bed really the right way or something that's got a little bit more firmness? And what about the pillow and pillow placement? I think the the mushy soft bed is probably contraindicated for adults uh, who start or starting to have joint problems. Um, you want a firm um, firm support, but not so hard that you're sleeping on concrete and you damage your joints. Um, the pillow is a is a real individual thing. Um, however, the old idea of sleeping on your side with your spine in a line is, is a perfect, uh, way to sleep. Interesting. Uh, you don't, you don't want your head, uh, uh, crooked down on your chest and you don't want your head, uh, bent at a 45 degree angle to either too hard or, or a pillow that isn't, uh, doesn't conform properly to your particular proportions. So how does one get a good pillow? I mean, do you go, you go and try different pillows? I mean, you literally go to the store and sit there and, and try them out or is That's there one, one particular kind that we should look for in terms of what's inside of it? Uh, that, that's one way. I, I, uh, work with an orthogonist who's a, uh, uh, a chiropractor with, um, specialized, uh, specializes in alignment of the top three bones of the spine. Uh, and, uh, I tell all my patients to take your, your pillow to him, uh, to make sure that, that the alignment that he's establishing remains constant. So that uh, some people prefer a water pillow, um, uh, some people like a down pillow. Uh, it, there are so many pillows on the market. You have to, you know it when you feel it. You just, yeah. just sort of, it feels right to you, and off you go to sleep. What about some of the anomalies that happen in the night? You know, whether it's a, a nightmare, a bad dream, the the sleepwalker. Is it a good idea to wake up our partner when they are having one of these restless occurrences? Um, I, they usually are self-limiting, and they're not even aware of it. So uh, as long as they're not hurting themselves or you, um, I would just let it go. So it's better to let let them just stay stay asleep, even if They'll it's in a more asleep wakeful and sleep, and and they're uh, they they will eventually settle down. Interesting. What what about the wave? A sleepwalker sleep? is a whole, totally different thing. Oh, so a sleepwalker? Uh, do you want to wake them up, or do you I, want to I escort them back to they bed? They could fall downstairs and hurt themselves. As long so as you you're do... staying in bed, uh, you know, the, you will settle down and go back to sleep into a deeper sleep. And speaking of the deeper sleep, it, um, mm-hmm. it's my understanding that we have like waves or opportunities that come to us through the night when we can sort of jump on the sleep wave. I mean, I've observed this in myself, like occasionally I'll feel so tired around 830 or 9 that I really believe that I can go to sleep and I will go upstairs to bed and I will fall asleep and sometimes not move till five or six in the morning. Um, there are other times where I feel like I'm asleep. I, I could go to sleep. I go up to bed, I lay there and I'm, you know, counting sheep and I'm not falling asleep. Is there a, a, a sort of a rhythm within the body where it's more likely for us to catch the sleep wave? I think there is. I, I believe in that. I think that the body develops a standard and uh, it's not a it's not down to the to the minute or the second it's uh you know a relatively uh, uh fluid envelope of time where you should be going to sleep your body is telling you something you have to listen to it yeah And I think we bypass a lot of those signals, hence being sleep-deprived, rest-deprived, play-deprived, which contributes to our overall health and well-being. I think you're correct. I think with our modern lifestyle, we we really, it's it's a chore to um, complete 
everything each day that we set out to do. Sometimes we have unrealistic goals, and sometimes uh, things happen that interrupt our, our our flow of work or our our production. And um, you, you just have to be able to say to yourself, it's now time for me to sleep. We are nearly out of time, and I want to thank you for coming on the show and to send our listeners over to the alphacenter.com for more information. Once again, that's the alphacenter.com. And this would be really for um, help and information on oral appliances as a truly viable and helpful alternative to other forms of treatment for sleep apnea. To connect on Facebook, that would be the Alpha center on facebook and on twitter also the alpha center dr elliot alpha thanks for coming on the show again and imparting your wisdom and um strategies for a more restful night's sleep here come the tunes we'll be right back nothing gives happiness like a free gift unwrap your present by signing up for happiness headlines our monthly e-zine at harvestinghappiness.com stay tuned for more after the break One thing I know for certain, happiness waits for no one, and sometimes we all need support. We all have the freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable each day, regardless of external circumstance. Sure, things will inevitably happen in our lives that are out of our control. There is only ever one thing that is totally within our control, ourselves. When we have command of ourselves, we are better prepared to handle life and bounce back more quickly when challenges arise. Whether you see the glass as half empty or half full, the glass has the capacity to hold more. You have the capacity to be happier. The tool to harvesting your happiness is within your grasp. Are we happy yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. Each day we get to choose how we are going to show up for life. And at times we need tips for strengthening our well-being. Learn training strategies for greater emotional fitness and improved mental muscle tone at HarvestingHappiness.com. Alrighty then, we're continuing our conversation about the power and value of rest to our health and well-being My guest today is Dr. Sandra Dalton-Smith. She is an author, speaker, and board-certified physician. Dr. Sandra has an active medical practice in Alabama. She received her BS in biochemistry at the University of Georgia and graduated with honors from Mahari Medical College in Nashville. She has been an adjunct faculty member at Baker College and Davenport University in Michigan, where she teaches courses on health, nutrition, and disease progression. Dr. Dalton Smith is a national and international media resource on the mind-body-spirit connection and a top 100 medical expert in Good Housekeeping's Doctor's Secrets. Welcome, Dr. Sandra Dalton Smith. Today we're talking about your newest book, Sacred Rest, Recover Your Life, Renew Your Energy, Restore Your Sanity. Welcome. Hi, Lisa. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you. Let's talk about sacred rest. Rest seems like a very simple process, but there's a distinction between sleep and rest. Talk a little bit about the two. Well, that's the thing. Rest does seem like it should be simple, but if it's so simple, why are so many people struggling with it? Why why are so many of us spending our day and our time tired and exhausted? And I believe the reason for that is not just simply sleep deprivation, because we hear a lot about sleep, but we hear very little about rest. And sleep is not rest. They're completely different activities. But I believe that we have to learn how to rest better in order to sleep better. Define what rest means or what it looks like. Give us an example. Well, to me, rest is when we're restoring what we deplete. So every day we're depleting different things in our lives, and it really depends on the activities that we find ourselves doing. So, for example, a counselor is not physically very active. They're pouring out more from their emotional and their social reserves. 
Whereas someone who has a manual job, their body is being physically used throughout the day. So if I was telling a counselor that they need to rest more, I'm not necessarily telling them they need to sit and take naps or do a massage. What they're needing to do are the spirit, the social and the emotional type rest activities that will restore the areas where they're depleting. Whereas that person who's physically active, I would tell them they probably do need to focus more on things like active, low range active exercise to get their body flowing and their muscles relaxed. So what I think I hear you saying is giving the parts of the body, albeit if you're a counselor or somebody who's using your brain hard, to give the brain a rest and occupy the the rest of the body with other activities that give that brain some cooling off. Conversely, if you're using your body a lot, that you give your body a little bit of a time out and exercise your mind more. That's exactly right. It's a, it's a trade-off because so often what happens is our body, our mind, and our spirit get out of balance because we spend so much time in our day-to-day activities doing usually the same things over and over again. That's our, that's our career for the most part. There's something that you do on a regular basis and you're constantly pouring out into that area of your life. The problem is when we look at rest, we don't look at it as if we need to restore what we're depleting. We look at it as this singular issue where everything is encompassed in doing restful activities. But if you do the wrong type of rest, you'll still be tired and you'll still feel exhausted and unhappy. In your book, Sacred Rest, you describe seven types of rest. Can you can you share those with us? The seven types of rest are physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, social, sensory, and creative. And those are really just from my own experience when I was going through the process of burnout and, and very unhappy just with the, the way my life was going, which was interesting because you know, I, I'm a physician, so I spent a great part of my life in school training for a career that I thought I wanted. And when I got there, I was so unhappy in it that I had to start looking at what is it about this that's making me unhappy. And it's because I was just so drained. I, I, had pour, I was pouring out into areas and I thought I was getting the rest I needed, but I couldn't, I couldn't have been because if I, were, if I was getting the rest I needed, I shouldn't have been tired all the time. Well, you make uh, some interesting points in in areas that are a a bit more subtle than many of us might typically think of as rest, the the social rest. So when we talk about social rest, for for some of us, it is being social, you know, because we're so engaged in our careers that we're out of balance. Or for those of us who are overly social and active and always in the public, that it's it's the retreat from social, right? So it could work either in either direction. Mm Mm-hmm. That's true. And when I look at social rest, the, what I like people to recognize is when you think about rest, always think about restoration, because whatever the rest is, for it to be beneficial for you, there has to be something that's being restored, something that's being poured in that you pour out. And so for a lot of people, social rest is starts with recognizing those relationships which revive you from those which drain you. Because there are pe- everyone in your life is either taking or giving something to you. Um, and a lot of times we don't recognize that because they're just the people in our circle. But there are some people who being around them automatically will make you feel better because those are the people who are pouring back into your life. And then there are those people who, whether they mean to or not, are pulling from you because you are the energy that they, they need. You're the motivation and the, the person that they come to. <laughs> You're their survivor. So they're pulling from you. And so it's, it's important to recognize that because you need to make time for those people who revive you just as much as you do for those people who, who pull from you. I think you make a very good point. We all have experienced the energy vampire, right? The one that just sucks the life out of us when we're in his or her presence. Mm-hmm. And the the other side is, uh, like you say, some people are givers of energy. There are some people that you walk into their orbit and you feel like you have been replenished just by their presence. Absolutely. And the thing is, the people who have a tendency to drain us, are the ones who are, the, are likely to call you first because they're needing something you have. And it's not that they're being selfish, it's just the nature of relationships. 
They need something you have. So they're the first ones to call you. Those people that you that revive you, they're the ones who are more likely being overlooked because yeah. we kind of tend to put them on the back burner for for when we have time to get to them. Interesting. Yeah, I, I can see how that happens. Your work has been featured in Women's Day, Red Book, and First for Women magazine. Um, I, I think you uh, regularly contribute to these periodicals. And what kinds of stories have you learned from readers who have connected with you? I think the biggest the biggest thing I've seen is that women as a whole, we look at rest as this thing we're going to do when we have time. We're so busy being moms or CEOs or we're homeschooling or we're in the boardroom. It, and what I find is it really doesn't matter what, what the platform is. We have a tendency to keep piling things up on our plate without ever taking a, a moment to taste the, the good things that are before us. So we've become excellent at producing and we've become very pitiful <laughs> at consuming the goodness we produce. And yeah. it leads to an, it leads to a lot of unhappiness, um, lifestyle unhappiness, because we're, we're so driven to produce and we become, I always give the analogy of the mosquito and the bee. You know, they're both pretty much doing the same thing. They're buzzing around and they're busy. One we see as annoying because they, they don't really produce anything. Mosquitoes don't produce, they just keep irritating. <laughs> Bees we see as more productive because there's sweetness that comes from what they what they spend their time toiling in. But if we just keep producing sweetness in our lives and we never taste it, what's the benefit? <laughs> well, I'm thinking of the mosquito, the, literally the blood sucker, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to take a break in a minute. But before we go, I want to um, share with our listeners that in your book, um, the, the sacred rest, you've got a rest quiz. Talk quickly about that rest quiz before we jump off to the break. Well, I think it's important to know what type of rest it is you really need. So as we talked about, like with someone who's very physical in their job or someone who's using more of their social or emotional reserves, the rest quiz helps you decide. Sometimes it's not so cut and dry. You know, some careers, you're using a bit of everything to, to be creative and to be productive. So taking the rest quiz, it's, it's a comprehensive opportunity to find out which type of rest are you excelling at and which types do you need to really spend more time focusing on. And the book we're talking about today with Dr. Sandra Dalton-Smith is Sacred Rest, Recover Your Life, Renew Your Energy, and restore your sanity. To learn more, please visit her website at www.ichoosemybestlife.com. On Twitter, she can be found at Dr. Dalton Smith. And on Facebook, that page is Dr. Sandra Dalton Smith. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. And that is a promise. And we'll talk more about the value of rest and how you can create more restful experiences for yourself. Here comes the break. Who says money can't buy happiness? Check out Lisa's new book, Are We Happy Yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life and other fun, fashionable, and inspiring items at shophappy at harvestinghappiness.com. We'll be right back after this quick break. Do you find yourself saying things like, I'll be happy when, or I'll be happy if... Does the finish line for happiness keep moving? Does the bar keep getting higher? What's getting in the way of your happiness right now? Too much going on? Working too much? Not working enough? Having too many responsibilities? Not having enough money, enough time, enough space? The list goes on and on. It becomes difficult to see all that we have if we focus on scarcity. One thing I know for certain, happiness waits for no one. And sometimes we all need support. Are We Happy Yet? is not another self-help book. It's a guidebook for learning how to harvest happiness through self-mastery, which is the key ingredient into building resilience, hardiness, grit, and emotional stability. Are We Happy Yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com.
Each day we get to choose how we are going to show up for life, and at times we need tips for strengthening our well-being. Learn training strategies for greater emotional fitness and improved mental muscle tone at HarvestingHappiness.com. Welcome back to Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. If you're just joining us now, I urge you to download and share this podcast. Why? Because sharing is caring. It's kind, it's free, it's legal. And we're, we're talking about sacred rest. Recover your life, renew your energy, and restore your sanity. This is the new book by Dr. Sandra Dalton-Smith. So Sandra, Dr. Sandra, Tell us about what rest means in the books. I mean, you, you, you spoke about the seven types of rest, but what does rest stand for? In the book, I break it down into four sections. So for each of the seven types of rest we just discussed, I take each one and I look at recognizing your rest. That's the first R. And then we evaluate your current position so that you can determine really where you're at on your rest spectrum. Then I start going into the science and the research so that we can kind of take into consideration what the latest research is saying about that particular type of rest. And then the last thing is is a today's application so that for each of the seven types of rest, someone can read through that chapter. They'll know what their risk is. They'll see where their current position is at. They'll get an understanding for the science and research, and then they'll be able to take away some tips on what they can do that day to try to get more of that particular type of rest. So when we talk about the science of rest or the science behind rest, we're not talking solely about sleep. We're talking about what goes on in our bodies and our brains when we're in a restful state. Can you share a little bit about that? Why and why it's so good for us? The brain is so active. So I'm going to take one particular type of rest to describe that so that we can kind of just pick it apart because for each of the seven types of rest, I go through that, the science and the research. One of the types of rest we don't talk about very much is sensory rest. And so what sensory rest is, everyone knows they have five senses. We don't always understand or or really appreciate the endless onslaught of, of sensory input that we're receiving on a daily basis. I mean, just someone who's sitting listening Right now, they're feeling their clothes against their body. They might feel some tension in their muscles or their back somewhere from where something's touching them in a way that's uncomfortable. There are smells in the room from perfume your coworkers might be wearing or the hairspray that you have on. There's (laughs) lights from your computer or your iPhone. There's constant sensory input. And that constant input, we don't really take into account the effect it has on us scientifically, biologically. We don't take into account what is that doing to us. But then when we get ready to go to bed at nighttime, we, we have these images flashing in our head and our mind and we get we feel uncomfortable and we can't find the right position. And we're trying to we're, we're trying to take ourselves out of this constant sensory input stage into a con into a, a automatic sensory shutdown. And the body doesn't work like that. There, there's a transition that has to occur really for you to get from that point of ongoing input to being at that calm, restful state that takes us into the non-REM and ultimately the REM sleep that we desire. So is what you're saying that we need this sort of powering down period and that the that that state of going from sensory overload to removing those um, those stressors to then going through a process to power the, the mind down to be in that state that's receptive to rest and ultimately sleep. Yes. And I believe that's that's the disconnect so many of us have. We want we try to go from our full power full on lives to high quality sleep. And we refuse to walk through that bridge of rest to get from one to the other. And that rest can be as simple as maybe coming home from work, maybe having a a walk around your neighborhood, transitioning into making a, a meal together with your family. So you get involved in conversation and bonding and it's sort of the process of moving from the busy life to the quiet life to sleep. Absolutely. And that that takes into account a lot of those seven pieces. For example, the emotional aspect of it, just as you mentioned, being around people where you don't feel the need to people please or to be inauthentic. You know, we all have our personal professional personas when we're at work. 
when you get home and when you're around the people who you know accept you as is, you know, with your ponytail and no makeup, those are the people that we want to be able to let our hair down literally and, and be able to relax with. And you want to be able to have face-to-face time with them, not time through a text message or, you know, an email blast with your family, to, uh, but actually face-to-face time. When we put our electronics down and we dim the lights a little bit, we light some candles and we go outside for a walk and we take that time before we go to bed to clear our mental space, to not ruminate over the things we wish we had done or wish we'd said, but we actually let our mind go to that quiet spot where we can then kind of be more receptive receptive to easing into a calm state of mind, body, and spirit. Let's talk for a minute about the value of exercise in enabling us to rest. Because oftentimes I see clients in my practice who will say, I'm depressed, I, I have insomnia, I, I, I don't know what to do, and I'm going crazy. And there's, uh, there's, there's some truth to that. <laughs> there is some truth to that. Um, what I find is sometimes people, when they think of exercise, there's there's your physical aerobic, you know, I'm trying to stay healthy and get my cardiovascular energy level and all of that stabilized. And then there's a type of exercise that is more restorative in nature. It does a greater job at just restoring circulation in the body so that your cells that are designed to come in and fight for you on your behalf can do their job. So I think that's first first thing. So both exercises are necessary, but so often we we get into this mindset that one will take away the other. So the type of exercise that like if I if I go out and I'm running, you know, a five mile run at a at a steady pace where I'm huffing and puffing, that's a bit of a physical stress on the body. It's good stress and it's needed because you need to have that bit of stress just for your physical health. But then there needs to be a time at the end of that where I'm just walking at a leisure walk and I'm not trying to beat the person in front of me and I'm just enjoying the process of moving my body without having a specific, you know, mental goal of trying to reach something. So exercise has to have kind of two components to it, that component where it becomes almost a spiritual thing and not just this physical activity that I'm doing. What about creativity? You mentioned that being one of the forms of rest. And I think this one is often unspoken when we talk with, when we talk with clients and when we speak about feeling rested and and, and fulfilled in our lives. Talk about that. For me, creative rest is about experiencing beauty and allowing beauty and awe to inspire us and to liberate us for, to, wonder and imagine and to to be open to to receive ideas and so often with creative rest a, a large portion of it is connecting with with god on a deeper level so that we start looking at things as as everything is created in into in some um, level of creation and so that we can can gain motivation and inspiration from that I think that's a lot of the science actually shows that's why so many people feel feel energized when they're around bodies of water, because we look at that and it's so magnificent and the ocean's so expansive. And when we see that, there's a bit of awe and wonder that occurs. Same thing when you're at the Grand Canyon or at, you know, some beautiful natural occurrence, a waterfall, there's a bit of awe and wonder. And it makes you think not just about kind of your tiny bubble that we live in, but just kind of the, the the big picture. So the the creativity component, in your view, is not um, the creativity that comes from making. Although for some people, they may experience that spiritual connection when they are making something, they're they're crafting. But what you're talking about is the is the creativity is is the big picture in the in the universe. Well, not just that, because some people get the same experience around beautiful music. So it's all created things, whether they're man-made or god-made it's Mm. all creative things because i've walked into museums where i've seen artwork that literally gives me chills (laughs) so it's it's the appreciation of 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 the created and i think the what ends up happening is when we get around those types of situation it does cause us to want to create because it awakens something in us it awakens that 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 awe and it inspires us and that's why I say it oftentimes liberates wonder. 
and it liberates us to be able to then be open to create. I think so many people feel they're not creative because they haven't allowed themselves to, to open to the possibility that it doesn't have to look like someone else did it. It doesn't have to fit some mold. It can look however it comes out. If you're creating art or music, it, there, there's standards that we've placed on it just because you know it's something that's it's a commodity now that's sold. But that doesn't mean that what you create is not beautiful to you. Talk a bit more about the connection uh, between spirituality and well-being, because there there is a significant amount of research that is being done today about what happens to our brains when we are engaged in spiritual practice. That's one of the biggest areas that I feel really kind of pulled me into this topic on rest. One of the recent studies I'd read was talking about how things like prayer and meditation, that that those experiences, when they did MRI brain wave activity, it was as if we were actually talking to someone that was directly in front of us. And so that those spiritual experiences were actually creating within our mind the same type of communication pathways that get created when we talk to, like I'm talking to you right now, the same type of memories and creative pathways, the same type of memories as if I'm sitting by my husband and having an intimate conversation, those same pathways get created. And when you think about the power of that, it's it's very easy to see how someone who may feel misunderstood or or may feel as Mm -hmm. if insecure in some way, that having that type of conversation would open their mind up into a whole different way of seeing, you know what, I, I'm valuable. I'm valuable enough that God is having a conversation with me. I'm not sure how much more value we can get in this world. <laughs> yeah, so, so, and, and that is not just this, this out there kind of thing, but it is creating something inside of me. It is creating memory synapses in my brain. It is creating a space that is being occupied with that relationship. We are out of time. Dr. Sandra Dalton-Smith, thank you for being on the show. To learn more about her latest book, Sacred Rest, Recover Your Life, Renew Your Energy, and Restore Your Sanity, please visit her website at ichoosemybestlife.com. On Twitter, you can connect at Dr. Dalton-Smith. And on Facebook, that page is Dr. Sandra Dalton-Smith. Dr. Sandra, thank you for for sharing with us today. What you provide is so valuable, the value of rest for our mind, body, spirit, emotion, and ultimately our health and well-being. We have flown through another hour of purpose-driven media designed to inspire and delight you, our listeners, to create more joy in your lives and within your communities. Here are a few thoughts before we part. Happiness is not a destination. It cannot be bought, sold, or traded. Happiness will never invite you to the party. It simply comes down to a choice to show up each and every day in the world with passion, purpose, place, and meaning. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. This is Lisa cypress Cayman and my amazing guest today, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Go out and rock your day. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio with Lisa Cypress Kamen. Join us each and every Wednesday for a brand new episode of consciously curated talk radio from the heart. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime from the comfort of wherever you are with hundreds of free downloadable podcasts from our libraries on Toginet, iTunes, and SoundCloud. In a complicated world seemingly driven by nonstop negative news, Lisa's mission is to celebrate the upside of life and seek the silver lining of our challenges by transforming them into uplifting growth opportunities for all. To learn more about Lisa's global consulting services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio is produced in collaboration with Toginet Radio, KBUU, RadioMalibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.